We are a community working to improve education through open education. And our members now represent almost 800 institutions. And we build capacity through professional developments and provide multiple pathways for publishing support, which includes this uh, partnership with Rebus Community and also Pressbooks. So we're here today uh, to talk about MOUs, contracts, and agreements. Who doesn't want to talk about that? Um, of course, they're often starting points for creating open textbooks and really necessary in clarifying expectations and responsibilities during the creation process. I know there are some people in this call who are um, thinking about contracts and possibly rereading them uh, as different issues come up and uh, projects progress. We are going to talk about specifically um, the adaptable OER publishing agreement which we collaboratively created with Creative Commons USA. And Meredith Jacob is here today to talk a lot about that process. The Rebus community was involved and um, different members of the Open Textbook Network um, also engaged their council and copyright librarians in reviewing early drafts. So um, this document was developed in a way that we hope makes it easy for you and other institutions to edit it and meet your own campus intellectual property policy requirements. So that's in the chat. I'm happy to share it again. I'm not sure if when you enter the call if you're able to see um, previous chats um, historically. So let me know in the chat if you can't see the link. Um, okay, you can't. I see Kathy cannot. Okay, I'll paste it in there. Um, so, uh, if you have not been to an office hours before, it's very casual. This is really uh, your conversation to drive. We have two guests joining us today and they will talk briefly about their experience with agreements, their perspectives on why they're important or not, and recommendations they have um, for you as you implement or use these for your open textbook projects. We have two guests joining us today. The first is Anne Ludbrook, who is Copyright and Scholarly Engagement Librarian at Ryerson University in Toronto, and Meredith Jacob, who's Assistant Director, Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property, Public Lead, Creative Commons USA. She's at the Washington College of Law. So Meredith, I'm gonna turn things over to you um, if you would like to kick us off, and away we go. Great. Um, thank you for having me and thanks for everybody for getting on the call. Um, so I want to start at the beginning, which is the question of sort of why you would want a MOU or a cooperative agreement or a contract. And I think sometimes people um, can sort of start down the wrong path of thinking that you don't need a contract if money is not changing hands. And um, at least in some OER projects, if professors are doing the work for free or if they're doing them for some, through some other program where the money is being dispersed separately, there could be this idea that it's not important to have a contract because there's no money changing hands. And I would argue that in fact, um, you know, viewing that contracts about being about just the money sort of misses a lot of the important function that they have in making sure that at the outset of the project, everyone has the same expectations, right? So I think contracts serve a really important role in um, writing down and memorializing what everybody intends to do at the point where you, both parties still have the ability to negotiate that and where you have the ability to either fix problems in your understanding or to not go forward. Um, because once the work has been created, it can be a lot harder to go back and change what you agree between the two of you. Um, so I think the, the first thing to think about when you think about what your um, contract or MOU does is to agree on ownership and authorship of the work. So um, for many higher education institutions, there are policies in place about um, faculty ownership of their own scholarship. Um, in a lot of institutions, that's either less clear or different for materials created for in-class use than it is for scholarship that's created and published in a journal or as a book. Um, and for OER materials, which often take 
um, faculty work that has been created in the course of teaching and then formalizes it, um, it's really important, first of all, just to agree on who the author is going to be in the case of multiple authors, possibly, or individuals and institutions, and then also who's going to own it. Um, and so in these contracts, you can lay out whether the owner is going to be the author themselves or the institution. Um, and the choices are there. And so I think it actually matters less what choice you make in the contract, but just that both parties are clear at the outset. Um, so that's the authorship question. Um, it's also important to know that under copyright law, um, if you are making an assignment, it has to be explicit, it has to be in writing. And if you are, um, there's actually only certain categories of work that can even be considered work for hire um, if they aren't in the course of your employment. And so the formalities matter. So you can get to a point where even though you thought you agreed on, for example, transferring ownership to the institution, if you didn't go through certain formal steps in the contract, you may not have actually done that in fact, which is also important to remember. Um, it's also important to have a contractor agreement so at the outset of the project, the material is licensed under an open license. So um, you don't want to have a situation where uh, author creates something and then changes their mind about the open license later in the process and um, you don't have the ability to go back and renegotiate. Or just they say, you know, actually, I'd rather keep this. And that's a lot of sort of lost time and effort, even if it's not lost money. Um, and again, there in the contract, it should say the author licenses this, not that they agree to do so at some future date, but that they license it in the contract itself. Um, and that's something you can see in the adaptable uh, OER agreement as well. Um, and then finally, I think it's a, it's a good way to uh, memorialize other details in a central place. So it's not just um, a sort of long boilerplate of legalese. It's also a plate to, in a formal standardized way, agree on what is going to be delivered. So are they delivering a Word doc? Are they delivering a print-ready file with images? Are they delivering both of those things plus online uh, simulations, like write that down in one place. Um, are they, when are they going to deliver it? What's the penalty if they don't deliver it? Can you take an incomplete delivery and get somebody else to update it? If everything is done perfectly and it is delivered on time and you go ahead with it, who has the right to update it in the future? The open license gives anybody the right to do it from a copyright standpoint, but um, just from an institutional goodwill standpoint, you might want to agree whether they have sort of first right of refusal to do it or whether they don't have any interest in doing it. And all that stuff, just agreeing about it and really reading it, making sure it reflects the intention of both people at the outset is super important. So you should have a contract or an MOU so that you know what you're agreeing on. And I would humbly argue you should use this one or another fully fleshed out real contract so that it does all of the enforceable pieces about copyright transfer and licensing that you mean to do. Um, but I don't think that you want to, I think too often people look at contracts like this, like the, you know, Apple click through licenses or the ones you sign at Verizon where like you just want to scroll through it as fast as possible to find the place where you sign. And I would really encourage people to not treat them that way to say, does this do a good practical job at setting out what we think we're going to do, who's going to do it, when they're going to turn it in, what form they're going to turn it in, all that stuff. It, you know, a well-written contract should do that for you in addition to doing the legal pieces. Um, and so that's my pitch for what this is and why you should use it. Um, I'm not going to walk people through the agreement itself. Um, I think most people have already looked at it. But if there's any questions about any sections of the agreement, happy to discuss that uh, in the Q&A section of the call. Thank you, Meredith, for the introduction and overview. And thank you very much for creating this agreement and sharing it with us. We are very grateful and are um, really happy to have your expertise. So, um, Anne, I would like to turn 
over to you and um, your experience. Yeah, so what happened at Ryerson is that we actually had contracts coming in from an outside organization that were granting, um, uh, giving us grants. The, con the contract was actually quite complex. And in fact, our, our Ryerson Council read it and they actually advised on what was wrong with it because in some cases our deliverable was just a report and not the actual um, um, <laughs> textbook or um, learning resource. So it was interesting that they themselves had crafted an agreement that had holes in it that actually gave us no real deliverable. Um, so that was actually, I think, in the next round um, improved because they actually, the Ryerson lawyer actually agreed to help with that but we actually didn't do um memor for our first stage grants we didn't actually have mo uh, we don't have um mous with students and we don't have um we didn't do mous with um with some of the extra authors um that agreed to do it so in a sense we are going to be doing backtracking to get that done and um, one of the issues was there wasn't this adaptable open um, educational resource template is really good because before Creative Commons just even would just link you out to um, normal agreements, um, you know, legal agreements that you would have where the Creative Commons issues are, are different. Um, like I read a lot of different um, agreements, but in some ways Creative Commons CC BY agreements are actually more difficult um, and are, there's more issues to think about than even um, agreements that you might have for um, textbook, like a regular textbook. I used to work in the textbook industry where we might say in an uh, agreement that we sent to authors that you don't have to worry about screen grabs because we would make risk analysis. And you don't make risk analysis with um, Creative Commons grant uh, materials you can't do that same kind of thing because you don't know how it's going to be used further on um, down the um, long path under a CC license by license so it actually is more complex and more difficult in terms of images and a lot of content that goes into the materials than it is in just a traditional textbook publishing I think that there are more things to worry about more things to um, to be aware of just in terms of images, how you're going to be doing the citations, is it going to be created, um, everything is CC by except as noted, you know, we're, um, so I think that there's lots of um, issues to think about. So what we're doing for our next round of grants is because that's generally how in Ontario right now a lot of open projects are going forward. Um, our library as well is going to be funding some open um, educational resource grants as well. And so we're going to be onboarding much more um, with um, agreements like this adaptable open educational resource, but also the memorandum of understanding kind of templates that Rebus um, has created um, in their students' guide because we're hoping that more students, one of our um, ways that we're going to go forward is to have students it's been very successful having students help with open textbook um, production and uh, so we're going to have to have those memorandums of understanding because they're not uh, the often students we hire for these kinds of projects are working on research grants or there is research assistants so they're not technically in the same kind of employment um, status as if they're a work-study student so there's an, they're an employee where um, their work is covered Covered. Um, so that's going to be really important going forward. So what I really did, even though I had copyright expertise, there were some, um, there, was, there was a learning curve for me as well to just understand how much more rigorous you have to be with a CC BY license in particular. So any questions or is that an, enough or? That's great. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> it's fun to, to um, be able to benefit from your uh, experience and background in the textbook industry and kind of compare um, that experience with um, open education. So that is it in terms of guests giving their introduction and now really we would like to hear from all of you, your questions, your case studies, your um, what you wish you had done scenarios, um, both past and present. So um, feel free to unmute or give your questions in the chat and um, you'll take it away. So my, I may actually jump in first. Great. Uh, just to, to loop back on the MOU that Anne mentioned with students. So this is 
I think, a very, very light version, I'm fairly sure I wrote this, uh, of, of what this can look like. And I think it actually provides a nice uh, balance because there are other relationships going on in, in textbook publishing other than, say, institution and faculty member or publisher and faculty member and this was a, a a way for us to try and start thinking about those relationships as well and and doing exactly what Meredith said of trying to be really upfront about the implications of the work that the student was about to to go into and I think particularly with student work we, we really wanted to be clear in that sense and in our own uh, experience with uh, working with the projects that we've been with we haven't really uh, because we haven't had the same formalized relationship of publisher and project, uh, we haven't gone into it in much more detail than this, but we, we like this uh, student one as, as a framework um, for, for those other kinds of relationships that are involved. That said, it, as I say, was drafted in-house and feedback would be welcome on it. Um, um, it's definitely not as rigorous as, uh, as the kind of things that, uh, that Meredith and Anne have described. So just wanted to provide a bit more context with that. And now uh, over to anyone with questions. Amy shared an MOU in the chat that she's using. Amy, would you be willing to talk a little bit about how you came up with that? Sure, yeah. So I started with a kind of standard contract template that worked for Lynn Benton, which is the fiscal agent on Open Oregon's grant from the state of Oregon. Um, and I mean, to me, I, it scarcely matters really what's on it as long as it lets the people in the business offices feel like they understand that we're starting this process, someone's going to have to write an invoice, Lynn Benton is going to need to pay the invoice. Um, so um, it's, you know, it's sort of a way for everybody to get on the same page. And um, I just started using DocuSign um, after hearing somebody talk about it in the context of um, their institutional repository process. And I thought, I really need that. Um, fortunately, Lynn Benton does have an institutional license. It's so slick. So um, there's a template in DocuSign and it recognizes when I've filled in the parts of the MOU that I need to fill in, it recognizes that it's created with this template. So there's a place for the person the project lead to sign to indicate that they'll complete the project as proposed and then there's a place for their institution to sign to say that they will invoice and they put in their federal tax ID number which Lynn Benton needs and then Lynn Benton countersigns to say that they'll pay and um, then there's usually like pages of the project proposal so that all the details of what was proposed are in one place but just to say I don't know if DocuSign I think DocuSign is not the only software that automates this and there are other options besides that but once i set it up it goes to the project lead once they electronically sign it it automatically goes to the next person and then it automatically goes to the next person and it will even automatically nag people so <laughs> it's like saving me so much time and um saving a lot of printing and scanning and like horrible pdfs so it's hopefully going to be life-changing <laughs> It almost sounds magical. Thank you, Amy. Uh, this is Kathy. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, um, I have not even considered students in the MOU uh, world. And um, I'm thinking, of course, of um, actual ham. What's her name um, on actual? Uh, Robin DeRosa. DeRosa. <laughs> okay, so in Rob and DeRosa's case, the students are actually helping write um, the item. Now, here at UConn, I have the faculty get their, their, um, their pay, their money for their OER, and then they can use that to pay grad students or whoever to do some, you know, the grunt work and so forth. Um, is that the kind of person that we would want to give an MOU to? Is that the, is that the use of a student, or are you talking just about creative uh, end of things? It's, 
it, it, are you directing it to me? I can say just in terms of, con if it's a research assistant, research assistants should have, it depends on how they're being hired in Canada. Anyway, it really is the employment status if you own the copyright or the or, or works that are being done by a student. So the student researcher writes up a, um, a report for you and you do, and they were not employed in um, as an actual employee of your institution, then they could be considered um, freelance and then they would own the um, copyright to the material. So it's actually part of, you know, in certain employment things we do with research students, ask for they sign employment agreements at Ryerson. I don't know if that happens elsewhere, um, but it does happen here depending on what, especially if there's commercial um, aspects to the project. Um, but I think that we haven't done that so far with the research students that have been working on our projects. Um, if they're work study students, that's it, the, it's not uh, that they're considered an employee. It really depends on how they're hired. So, yeah. All right. and, sorry, go ahead. Ooh, not me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought I heard someone jumping in. No. Uh, so uh, the the MOU that we have in the guide uh, has been more focused and was developed more for uh, open pedagogy specifically. And so Mark asked in the chat as well uh, whether we could talk more about the process with students, when to use the MOU and so forth. Uh, is it used in each course within an assignment or only when students are hired to work on a defined project? So specifically the MOU that we developed at Rebus for students was about uh, open pedagogy projects. So uh, with the mention of Robin DeRosa, it's a similar project to hers that she had started. We developed this in, uh, for another anthology project where students would be working with their professors to develop introductions and find the texts and and then they would submit to the to be included in the anthology uh, so that was very much about student work being done in the classroom that they would then be uh, offering up to become a part of, of the textbook that we're developing so that I think is a very different kind of case and that's uh, than when a student is actually hired or employed which I think Anne has spoken to very well okay. so hopefully that uh, provides a bit more clarity and Mark if you have any follow-up please please be free to ask too. Um. I might just follow up on that. I would agree that, um, you know, the, the Rebus student MOU here, I think serves a lot of good functions about sort of telling students about what you intend and, you know, getting some acknowledgement that they understand that. It doesn't by itself do anything about copyright, right? Like you have, at least in the US, you probably haven't in that agreement done anything. To affect the copyright status of what comes out the other end, right? They probably haven't agreed to either transfer the copyright to you or agreed in any binding way to put a CC by license on it. So I think it's a really good document to say this is what we're planning to do, but then you need to, at the end of the open uh, pedagogy process, when you actually have a resource you're going to publish, they either need to put the CC license on the material themselves. Um, or they need to formally agree to that. Um, and so I think it makes a lot of sense for something like this where there isn't an exchange of money or other credit, remuneration, whatever. And so there, it's okay with you if later in the process they say, no, actually, I don't want to openly license this, or no, I don't want it included. Whereas if students are being yeah. paid or receiving some other graduate credit for creating the work, then I think it's important that it's either you're very, you need to either be very clear in your institutional capacity that they are hired as a regular employee. So at least in the US, if you're hired as a regular, you know, full W2 employee, work created in the course of your employment is owned by your employer. Um, so in that situation, you need to make sure that you've agreed with the university that you can openly license this, right? So whoever's the author has to put a license on. So in theory, you know, um, then it would be the university that owned it. And so you'd need to have the ability for the university to agree to openly license it. So um, that's, those are sort of the two situations. Um, and if students were being paid in any way other than as a completely standard uh, W-2 employee, you'd want to like if there was any question about like whether it was really 
a grant as opposed to hourly employment or like the nuances of how student work is supported, I would want to be certain at the outset that I knew how that was going to be treated. And under US law, the two questions are, is person really an employee? And was this work in the course of their employment? Mary, does something you said in your introduction um, sparked my interest, and that was, you know, clarifying delivery terms and a scenario when perhaps the delivery is not made. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you or anyone else who is here in the call with us can share um, examples of what, for lack of a better word, teeth there may be in a contract for if somebody does not deliver what's expected or on the timeline that you hope, um, how do you work in that kind of situation um, in, the, in the contract setting? Sure. Um, so when someone hasn't done that, um, I think the things you look for in a contract would be what are the penalties? So is there a financial penalty for late delivery? Like, are we going to pay you less if you deliver late than if you deliver on time? Um, the structure of if or how payments are tied to milestones in the contract. Um, so, you know, do you get paid some amount at the outset, some amount when you deliver a first draft manuscript, and some amount when you deliver a final one? Um, so that to think through what makes sense for that, especially in the university context where because the person is also an employee, like if you were giving someone a stipend, the default might be that it was paid out prorated over the course of the stipend period with their regular paycheck and not made as a transfer on the dates of these certain delivery because those two processes for someone who's also an employee, not just an independent contractor, might sort of run separately. Um, I think about that. You know, realistically, you're not going to take these contracts and go sue somebody and try to get specific performance, like to try to get them to actually like write the book even though they don't want to. Like that's probably not going to happen. You probably wouldn't get it. It's probably not worth your time. Um, but so what I would just say is think about that. And then the other thing probably um, pragmatically to think about is what you do about um, incomplete work. You know, because I think in a lot of scenarios what happens is someone has <clears throat> most of it and doesn't finish it. And so then questions about if, you know, we've paid you – half of this money and you've delivered us like a, a decent manuscript, but you haven't really finished it and it doesn't look like you're going to finish it. Can we hire somebody else to finish it and then use that work? And that's one of the reasons to get the contract to say that it is under a CC license that you, not that you agree to license it, but that you do license it. Right? So the contract here says I do license this under a CC license which means that you don't have to get agreement at some later date that it has actually been done. The, the decision to license happens in the contract, which I think um, increases your options for having pieces from other people that are added to the final version. Present tense is important, it <laughs> sounds like. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you mentioned that you um, worked on a project where you didn't have, have agreement going to need to go back and, and form some of those. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk at all about um, your thoughts or feelings about how that might go? I don't think it'll be a problem because the people, everyone that was involved in the project was told on the outset and agreed to be doing a CC by license. So I don't think it will be a problem um, except for one group that, um, that actually have already said that they didn't want it to go under CC BY, so misunderstood what we said at the beginning. And if we had had a contract right from the beginning and sent it out, then they wouldn't have been able to say this now. So we're actually gonna have a chapter in one of the projects that's gonna have to be licensed differently from the rest of the book in the sense um, that we're gonna have to put the, the resource under, um, you know, unless otherwise noted and then, um, put their chapter under an NC license. So I think that 
it can cause problems because people maybe there's not clear expectations from the beginning. I, I would say that especially with faculty um, that get grants um, for Creative Commons um, licensed material is that they often are there for the grant and not there necessarily for the CC by licensing. So it's very important to get all faculty members, especially if they own copyright to their material, on board right away. Anyone that's involved in our project right now understands that, but um, that could definitely be a problem if you're dealing with someone who wasn't isn't happy in the end and they've already done the work. So I think it can be risky with faculty in particular. I think students as well. Um, students own the if you're doing something within a course, you really do have to get those copyright licenses from the students. We haven't done that yet at this point where students have been contributing and writing, but if that actually is the case, which it hopefully will be in the future, um, that's really important because you could have a student that just says, well, no, I decide I'm not going to for whatever reason, because they're an agent, right? They have their own agency. They're not affiliated with the institution in the same way. Um, so I think that that's really important up front, up front if you're going to have students contributing to material to actually have the copyright transfer agreement or have them exactly assign the Creative Commons license themselves to have that up front. At this point, I don't think it's going to be a problem going forward. I can certainly report back if it is and send it and post it up on. Um, I don't think it will be a problem, but it, it definitely clarifies right from the beginning what you're doing. I, uh, I might chime in again just on the, the student uh, point again, not having been the instructor running it, but having spoken to instructors who've run open pedagogy projects that have evolved uh, student work going into an openly licensed text, that I, I know there is a thread through their considerations and discussions of this as well about ex that agency that Anne mentioned. Uh, and I wonder if that is, in, in that particular case, actually an argument for the licensing decision to happen at the end, uh, so that the student uh, is not, uh, there are often concerns about the quality of the work, about it going out into the world, them not feeling like it will reflect well on them. Uh, I think, and there's a lot of learning that happens over the course of a project like that for the students in class about what it means to uh, to be writing for, for an open resource. So I know that there are kind of a few more complexities there and, and it wouldn't actually surprise me if, if some instructors took the approach of, of actually doing the license agreement at the end when the students know what they're submitting and what to, that they've had a growing understanding. Uh, just as a, a counterpoint. Meredith, I think you might be talking, but we can't hear you. I muted my phone, sorry. <laughs> I was talking to myself. Um, so I was gonna say, I think Zoe is completely right that there are contexts in which doing it at the end is appropriate. And it just depends, like, are you doing this in a class and you have every right to say, no, I don't wanna openly license this? Or are you doing it because you got paid? And then like, that's the deal. Um, I also think, uh, Zoe, you were talking about the worry about how this is going to reflect on them, the quality of the work. And one of the things I would remind people about is that that agreement at the end could also be an agreement about how the attribution would work in the final resource. Um, so for example, um, you could structure that agreement at the end in one of a couple ways. You know, One is the students could transfer ownership to the professor, the university, whoever and then be listed as contributors, but not be copyright owners and not be who's attributed in the CC license. The other option is, and this is a little, I don't think it's more complicated, but it is less sort of clearly delineated. The students could choose, because you have the right in the current versions of the CC license to specify how you want attribution. They could say, you know, I agree to license my work openly licensed, and I agree that the attribution should say, you know, 2018 geology class at the University of Maryland. And so you don't have to transfer ownership in order to alter attribution. And that's just another thing that could be done in a situation where that makes sense. This leads me to think about best practices in clarifying contracts. So, you know, not just like sending it as an attachment in an email and saying, great, sign this, send it back. 
Um, can, can people talk a little bit about, you know, what they found to be effective in really clarifying what someone is signing and so it, it feels like everyone kind of understands what's in this document and that you've done due diligence. And remember that meeting we had on March 13th where we sat down for an hour? Um, I'd like to hear thoughts on that. I can talk a little bit about that, about our new onboarding process, because now what we're doing is we're actually spending, for anyone who isn't even thinking of doing an open textbook grant for the fall, because there's apparently going to be a round again with eCampus Ontario in the fall for open um, grants in certain gap areas and some research grants, is that we're actually having a one hour grant um, uh, onboarding session that's really explicitly talking about what a CC by license or a CC by NC license is, going through what kind of rights they're going to have to transfer, what it means, um, just to onboard everyone who's even interested in applying for a grant. Because what we actually had last time at Ryerson is we had two people that had received a grant, applied for a CC by license. It had said clearly that it was a CC by license. We thought that they understood that. And then when they actually got the grant, our um, faculty association actually sends warning messages to you saying, oh, are you sure you wanna sign a CC by license? Because they're concerned about it. So we actually had two people that actually, it took three or four months to try to get that agreement finalized where they finally, they want the money, but they didn't want to sign the CC by license. So I think onboarding before you even, if you have a grant program, onboarding really early with faculty members who own the copyright to their work for, so that they really understand what it means and they're not resistant because not all people that are going for open textbook grants are open textbook, are open advocates. And I think that that's where it was at first. Um, I think that a lot of people like Rajiv or people in Can, you know, Rama DeRosa, well, they are people that were really committed to the open movement. That's not necessarily the case when there's large government grants or um, uh, statewide grant programs happening now. They are more doing it because it's part of a process and they may not really understand um, CC licensing at all. Yeah, I think that's exactly true. The, the other thing I would say is you can't, I think it's very hard to like this, the, um, the adaptable OER license looks more like a traditional publishing agreement than a lot of the um, sort of simpler um, more plain language versions people have used. I think it is stronger in terms of detail and enforceability because of that, but I do think it means that for the, you know, 20 odd people on this call, if you're handing this relatively complicated agreement to people and you want them to read it and understand it and sign it, you have to really understand it too. Um, and you have to be able to answer why are these clauses in here? Why does it say that? What does it mean when it says that? And um, I hope um, in the 20 minutes we have left in this call that I would encourage people to not feel, um, not feel silly or not feel like they shouldn't ask, like what does that mean in the contract or why is that there? Um, because I think in order to sell it to people, you have to explain to them why does it say this? Why is it this complicated? Why is that there? Um, and so I'm happy to help do that for this contract. I'm happy to take questions after. Um, the other two things I would say is I totally agree that getting it to people really early so they have a chance to read it sort of slowly and on their own before they're in the meeting trying to skim through it. And um, this sounds silly, but also give people paper copies. I think that for longer and more complicated um, legal documents like this, there's a reason that like lawyers still print everything out is being able to read it and make notes in the margin and sort of not just sort of reflexively like skim by like paging down is also really important just to making it digestible section by section. And I assume there are also other people um, one could invite to that meeting if they wanted some support in decoding the contract, especially in the first few meetings, like would you? agree i don't know would would council show up for a meeting like that or would you need a copyright librarian yeah, i mean i think my general counsel you know they're gonna be i think you know they will understand this but i don't think that 
that'll be true if you just sort of slide it across the table. I'll think they, they will need the same time to sort of read it and think about it and process it. So I would say yes, but only if you've had a pre-meeting with them to say, this is what I want to explain to people, take a read, let's talk about any questions so that we're on the same page. Not to assume that, you know, because this is sort of, you know, big university people don't do a ton of publishing law, and so you just want to make sure that they're on the right page before you sort of put them on the hot seat and you know that. I would also say, agree with that. Um, what I have found is that um, as we've been, just, the CC, CC licensing has really, at Ryerson anyways, only been a couple of years. And I was actually advising on some of the earlier contracts because the general counsel hadn't done CC licenses for some films that we were doing. This is a couple of years ago. And I think that, um, so there's a particular, there's one intellectual property office officer who's in um, our research office, who's actually come to, up to speed more on Creative Commons so she might come, but I don't know. They're so busy that I don't, I think that the, that kind of work would have to happen. And then maybe the cop, like I will be at the onboarding meetings um, that we're going to be doing and explain. Um, but I think that, um, and it's also, it goes beyond just the contract. It goes beyond their whole process, it goes into their whole process of how they approach the project and how different it is from a regular project in terms of being able to use fair dealing. Their uh, faculty are used to using fair dealing or um, various, uh, for using images and research papers. And so it's completely foreign to them to think that, oh, what do you mean I use that in a research paper? Why can't I use that image on something that's going out to the public? One of, um, one of the things about paywalls is paywalls mean that copyrighted material is not easily accessible, so the copyright holders can't actually see it. Um, and that is the difference, too, is that they're you know, faculty are using fair dealing or fair use um, for their research research and then it's surprising to them that they can't um, how limited it is for especially for image use um, so they have to be onboarded as well just on best practices for CC the contracts but also mm -hmm. best practices on how they're going to have to work oh Meredith I think you're uh, we can't hear you again. sorry I'm a, I'm a rogue muter um, <laughs> I'd be interested in hearing from the people on this call. We could think about running um, a contracting, a CCN contracting um, webinar that could, we can probably run one here that would be uh, both CLE credit, but also a little bit more um, useful and sort of hands on than those CLE things often are. Um, CLE is sort of notoriously like, you know, press the button, go make a cup of coffee. Um, but hopefully we could uh, figure out a way to do that in a way that would allow GCs to ask questions about this um, in a context that was sort of more familiar. Um, so I do think we definitely, I mean, one of the reasons like we kept a lot of the formal, well, the formalism exists in the adaptable publishing contract in part because it serves a purpose and because it's predictable. We know how courts will interpret that. It's one of the reasons in contracts you use the same language that everybody else says is because you know what courts will say that language means. It's a reason not to freelance. Um, but the other reason I think is that this publishing contract is modeled on and builds on real commercial publishing contracts. And so it looks and feels like the type of formal legal document that GCs are used to seeing. And so I think that that is an important type of signaling of saying, no, this is serious, we've thought about it, we've made these choices. Um, and I think for us, the question would be, what the most effective way to support those conversations were? You know, we aren't, I think we can, you know, if people are, get to a real stumbling block for a big project, we can come in and do one-to-one -one calls, but, um, you know, that's pretty resource intensive, but we'd also like to make these things go forward. So, I mean, the first answer is if you get really stuck, call us. The second answer is um, we'll try to figure out a way to do sort of GC focused stuff that probably is different than what we do to the public. Yeah, I think that would be 
Great, Meredith. And I suspect actually knowing uh, some conversations we've had previously is we probably also drew for something around fair dealing in, uh, in open textbooks as well and that there's some, some overlap there that Anne pointed out. <laughs> I was doing all my best behavior about that. I wasn't even going to say it. Um, but, uh, but yes, so Zoe has hinted at another thing, which is I think that um, in an effort to be very clear and very avoid uncertainty, um, people in the OER community have probably been more hyper-conservative about including materials under fair use and fair dealing than is um, probably necessary and probably productive in terms of teaching certain subjects. So um, one of the projects we're going to be working on over the next, I think, probably two or three years is um, a code of best practices about uh, fair use for educational resources with a specific focus on fair use in OER. Um, because while it is certainly true that fair use is dependent on the very specific context of the use, it's also true that to the extent that included materials are kept within the work as a whole, um, and in that context, that analysis is not going to be materially different among similarly situated institutions. So for example, if someone at the University of Minnesota embeds an image in a book for the purpose of critiquing that image, there's not a strong argument that that would be a different analysis in Massachusetts, right? Copyright law is federal law. The use is the same use. The institution is the same institution. And so I think one of the things to do as we go forward is to think about what are the low hanging fruit um, for those types of inclusions. And um, it's one of the rare moments where the really strong international harmonization of copyright law actually can provide us with some benefits, which is to the extent that those inclusions fall within the um, big umbrella of quotation, the need to have a quotation right in your national law is actually harmonized by treaty. So the Berne Convention says everybody has to have a quotation right. And so to the extent that those small inclusions fall within the national implementation of those quotation rights, they're actually going to be permitted in most countries. That's a big project. That's not a, a very full explanation of that. But I just would drop that footnote that hopefully as we go forward, we can think about the, the third party materials as well. Thanks, Meredith. Not to put you on the hot spot on that one. Oh, it's my favorite topic. We have like 45 <laughs> more minutes. We can talk about it. What is everybody doing at five? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot more to, to unpack around that, but uh, we'll, we'll loop back. And a program was actually considering something to come back to the kind of idea of agreement, so I'll hand over to it briefly. Thank you. Um, I just noticed that the conversation so far has been geared mostly towards contracts or MOUs with authors on projects, and there are a lot of other collaborators on an open textbook project, like an editor, a peer reviewer, a proofreader, and I'm just wondering what types of MOUs or contracts we would need to have with these types of, of volunteers on a project. Could either of you speak to that? Um, I'm happy to take a first shot. So the reason we care about authors is that they are so the authors are the people who as a default are the copyright owners so um for people who are like the question you need agreement with anyone who under your national copyright law would be an author so people who write down the text are authors people who make um almost all illustrations and included images are authors. Um, people who make the software to make simulations are authors. Maybe authors of the images, but definitely authors of the software. Um, so anybody who's making something that it would be considered a work of authorship is somebody you need an agreement with so you know who owns the copyright and that you can put it under a CC license. Editors aren't typically authors. They don't the fact that they alter the text doesn't make them an author. They have to actually have contributed substantial original text to the project. So for those people, you might want to have um, a normal uh, professional services agreement that I'm sure everybody's university has just to say, like, this is how much time you'll spend. This is when you'll bill us. But you don't need one 
that deals with the copyright and creative commons pieces unless that person is an author. Yeah, I agree with Meredith. I mean, they're not authors, but I do think that the member of understanding, it would be interesting though, for, especially for people that are volunteering as editors or as reviewers, um, it might be um, inter it might be a respectful and part of an open practice to actually have people um, sign off on a memorandum of understanding that they are um, contributing to an open project. I think that that would be that's I like that approach um, that you're sort of very upfront to your whole team about what the the um, end result is going to be, especially for volunteers. That's what I felt with the Rebus project that I've worked on is people are putting in volunteer time, they're not getting paid, they're, um, they're committed to, to a practice, and it's just a nice, pro it would be a nice pr process, so sort of that idea that you're all, it's not necessary copyright-wise, but I think that it's a nice um, addition to the open practice and process. So. Yeah, I absolutely agree uh, with you, Anne. And, and I think that was the spirit of the student MOU that we yeah. drafted and, and see very clear case for that with other volunteers as well. And I think, I mean, that might be a good place to sort of mention if there will be any recognition for the work that they've been doing on the mm -hmm. project. You know, it might just be a small section in the book, in the back matter, or whatever, but if we could put that down in writing and say, hey, you've been involved as an editor or as a proofreader, and we'd like to credit you for that work in the text, and we will be doing that. That might be a good spot for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, so uh, if someone has agreed to be a peer reviewer and you would like to put their names at the in the front of the book or somewhere, uh, acknowledgement, um, is that a case where you would suggest yes have them sign an MOU as a as knowledge of their own is that true is that what you're saying yeah we've been very informal with that to date but uh, and so we've just kind of got an agreement within an email of whether they want to remain anonymous or not but I certainly see that as as being a nice way to uh, to just have, have that shared understanding of, of what will be happening. And again, when it comes to volunteer work in particular, we're always looking for ways to, to show recognition of that uh, in ways that people are comfortable with. Because um, again, going back to the student question, it's, it's also about the, the self-determination, the agency of, of the people who are involved. And that adaptable agreement could be adapted for the peer reviewers or editors, or, or you'd have to come up with something sim simpler, something different. Yeah, I would so I would very strongly encourage people not to use MOUs or contracts that talk about authorship for people who are not authors. So what you don't want to do is create this thing that suggests a person who is not an author is an author. And so that's a publishing agreement. So I would do if I were to do something with someone who was doing volunteer work. I would do a shorter MOU that says, you know, this recognizes your volunteer commitment to this. Here's the timetable on which you'll do this volunteer work. We will list you as a contributor to the project in this location. I would not include their willingness to license it, their contributions under a CC by license because that implies that they have made an authorship con con contribution that you don't want to do. Um, uh, and sort of can't do. Um, and so I would just keep those two really separate. And so if it's a volunteer thing where they've agreed to peer review it and you've agreed to list them, something pretty short and informal is fine because neither of you have a lot of skin in the game, right? Like worst case, they don't review it. Um, but it's always good, I think, in the peer review process to make sure that you do or do not have permission to publicly state their peer review. So, um, you know, in many situations, if you get someone who is senior and that peer review is valuable, you want to memorialize up front, this is the project, this is the license we plan on, you know, you don't want to say that they agree to license, but you do want to say, this is this thing, it's this OER, OER is great, this is going to be CC by, we really appreciate your review, we're going to list you here. And that just gets up front that they don't go like, why did you put my name on that? You're like, well, because you reviewed it. Yeah, but I would keep the authorship and non-authorship pieces separate. 
Yeah, definitely agree with that. And and being the people in the room without the legal expertise, uh, that is the kind of thing that I think we would be able to put together and, and make something adaptable for others. And so we're making mental notes uh, of how we could kind of take the, the student MOU that we have already and, and make it a little more generic for, for other kinds of volunteers in these, in these projects. Uh, and looking at time, I think we're probably uh, at last call for any questions or comments um, coming down to the wire. Uh, anything else that people want to share for now? No immediate takers. If anyone's typing furiously, we'll, uh, we'll grab them. Um, but I'll be the first to say thank you very much to Meredith and Anne for your time today and for uh, the others who've, uh, who've joined us uh, in sharing their experiences. We hope this has been useful for you. Um, and Karen, if you'd like to say some final words too. Echo Zoe's sentiments. Thank you both. And thanks everyone for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone.